Let us pause for a word of prayer. My Father and my God who art in heaven, Lord, I am thankful for the wonderful opportunity to stand here today before your people. Father, I am not so presumptuous as to come here with confidence in my own ability. And so, Lord, at this time I ask that in spite of my inefficiency, that Christ, my sufficiency, will step in the gap. Speak to your people this afternoon, dear Lord. Help us to understand that what is going on here this weekend is indeed prophetic. Father, you are preparing a people to inflict the final deadly wound upon the papacy, a wound which shall never be healed. And Lord, I am thankful to be a part of that number that you are preparing to do this work. Bless us, be with every mind, and be with my mouth, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good evening. Good evening. I must say I am blessed to be here, and I am thankful. I want to say thank you to the Lord, thank you to the brethren, thank you to Pastor Brutus for the invitation. You know, I was very blessed this morning as I sat down and I listened yes. to the last message of mercy. Yes. That is the message of righteousness by faith. Yes. But I'm told that here I don't need to introduce it. Amen? Amen. Are we familiar with the message of righteousness by faith? Yes. You know, this morning as I heard the truth that Christ became me, it removed the sense of fear that comes in the Day of Atonement. Mm. You know, often we think about atonement, we're thinking about judgment, condemnation, yes. our, our lives passing in a record before, before the Lord, right? And we're afraid because we know what our lives look like. Mm -hmm. But beloved, I was given a different perspective this morning. Yes, sir. You see, my life looks just like Jesus. Come on, and that's because the word of God says so. Faith takes hold of the word of God. We heard yes. this this morning. Yes. And it believes and it depends. It what? believes and depends on the word of God to accomplish what it says it will get done. I believe that we're living in very solemn times. For those of us who are studying prophecy and watching the things that are unfolding, there are a lot of Adventists who are worried about the election, worried about what Pope Francis is doing and such and such. Beloved, my focus is on what the man of Calvary is doing in the most holy place for me. That is what I believe our focus should be on right now because there is a law of the mind. It says that by beholding... Oh, beloved, you sound like students. By beholding, we become changed. And so my focus, your focus, our focus this evening is none other than Jesus Christ. I was thinking to myself, and there's, this, there's a, a quotation in the book, Last Day Events, where inspiration says that under the loud cry of this 1888 message, beloved, thousands, what did I say? Thousands would be converted in one day. And it got me thinking. And I want to ask you a question, beloved. If the Lord gave you one day, not a crusade, not a week of prayer, one day, to present the gospel to somebody, what would you say? Would it be the Sabbath? Health reform? Dress reform? Beloved, there's nothing wrong with these reforms, amen? amen? We find them in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. But the fact of the matter is that Christ is the life of every doctrine that was given to the Adventist church. And so at the end of the day, I want you to turn with me in your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 8. Because I believe the scriptures can say this better than I can. In the book of Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26, the Bible says this. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou? What thou readest? Beloved, does Babylon understand what they're reading? But I believe that God is preparing a people who understand what the scriptures say in regard to Christ. Therefore, understand what the scriptures say in regard to us. Because Christ became who? Christ became us. Is that so? Are you glad that it is so? I'm glad that it is so. And so the Bible says in verse 31, And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. In verse 35, the Bible says, Then Philip opened his mouth, beloved, and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. 
If the Lord gave us one day to preach to the world, there is only one name that the world would want to hear, and that is Jesus, beloved. You see, the power in the 1888 message is not in saying 1888. We've made that mistake with 1844. The power in 1844 was that our great high priest who became us moved into the most holy place. Isn't that right? And that he is making an atonement for who? For me. Praise God. For each and every one of us. And so the power, beloved, in the 1888 message is not in understanding a date. Because God can do it without a historian. The power in the 1888 message is the fact that Christ is our nearest of kin. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Closer than your Siamese twin I heard this morning. He became you. Now, you remember the thief on the cross. The thief only had that one day, didn't he? Did he have time to get baptized? Did he have time to change his dress? No, but he had time to see Jesus Christ and him crucified, didn't he? And what was the effect of him seeing the Savior uplifted like that? The man was saved. Now, I just want to share this one more point before I move into the message. Turn with me to Psalms 119 and verse 66. Because my beloved, I was very, very happy this morning when I heard that the Ten Commandments are God's promises. God's what? God's promises of what he will fulfill in us. You see, the law of God, in order to be presented at this time, including the Sabbath, needs to be understood not from the prohibitory side. The Ten Commandments are not a list of do's and don'ts for sinners that cannot. I'll repeat it. The Ten Commandments are not a list of do's and don'ts for sinners that cannot. They are the promises of Almighty God to accomplish in us. The Bible says that it is he that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do you believe that God can get that done? And so when we come to the law and the law says, sinner, this is what you look like. As we heard this morning, we can say yes, but Christ stepped in the gap. Amen. Psalms chapter 119. And we're going to look at verse 66. How should the sinner consider the law of God? The Bible says, teach me good judgment and knowledge. For I have kept thy commandments. What does the Bible say, beloved? The Bible says, I have believed thy commandments. And so when the sinner comes to the law and he reads, thou shalt not. It's not a don't do this in your own strength or I will strike you down. He must understand that the law is saying that by my enabling grace, when I am permitted by your consent to come in and work through you, you will not. You will not steal, you will not commit adultery, you will not lie, you will honor your mother and your father. This is the effect of the Holy Spirit working in us. It is not the work of man, it is a supernatural work. And everyone in here is partakers of this. And we are invited to become partakers if we are not already. Our message for this afternoon is entitled, A Closer Look at the 1888 Message, The Last Beat of the Protest. Now what do I mean by that? How many of you are familiar with the term, the Protestant Reformation? Now, present truth, I'm not speaking about nominal Adventism, I'm speaking about present truth, seems to be divided at this time. There are those who focus heavily on the prophecies and what the man of sin is doing, isn't that so? And then there are those who focus simply on Christ and what he is doing. But beloved, we need to become an in the middle of the road people. We need to understand that prophecy does not hide righteousness by faith, and righteousness by faith does not throw away prophecy. The prophecy was that God would fulfill in his people what this message says would get done. The prophecy is that John saw a people. Amen? Revelation chapter 12 tells us, and, verse, and chapter 14 tells us, that John saw a people who are not trying, but that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about these things. Our objectives. We have two objectives because we have a, a, a short amount of time which in we, uh, within which we must work. Our objectives are to define what is the 1888 message. And the second is to understand why Satan is determined to keep Adventists from understanding it. And I'm going to give you the answer from the very beginning uh, so that as we move through, you can draw the conclusion more thoroughly. The 1888 message of righteousness by faith is the divine strategy for rapid, successful warfare in this final generation. Satan is afraid of this message because it is designed to inflict a deadly wound to the papacy 
that will never heal. And we're going to see this as we move forward. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And before we go there, I'm sure everyone knows who these two men on the screen are. Amen? On the right, we have Pope Francis, the leader of the first beast of Revelation, chapter 13. And on my left, we have President Barack Obama, who is the leader of the second, the second beast of Revelation, chapter 13. But I want to show you something very interesting. Turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation, the 13th chapter. And as we're going through this, I would have you remember that irrespective of the fact that we are coming towards the final crisis, there is no crisis where Christ is. Amen. The Bible says that he will keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. And so if prophecy scares you, beloved, it's because you've been watching Pope Francis too closely. You need to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Amen. Revelation chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, who? Dragon. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were what? Wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. For those of us who are studying and watching what's going on in current events, are we seeing that the deadly wound of the papacy is being healed? Yes. It is being healed. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world, how much of the world? I want you to mark that down. All of the world wandered after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That's the papal cry. Who is able to make war with the papacy? The Protestants cry is if God be for us, who can be against us, amen? And we're gonna answer this question, who is able to make war with the beast? Jump down to verse seven. Revelation 13, verse seven, the Bible says, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth. How many? Shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, many read these uh, familiar texts, and they come to the conclusion that our job at this time is to run about and to tell people not to get the mark of the beast. The text says that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So I think a much better message is to let you know how you may get your name there. Amen? Amen. If your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, you are guaranteed not to receive the mark of the beast. And the way that we get our names there is found, outlined perfectly, practically, individually, in the 1888 message. We're gonna see this. Now, in the book, The Great Controversy, page 234, paragraph two, is the font too small? All right, well, I'll, I'll read in your hearing. It says, let me move this way. Throughout Christendom, beloved, Protestantism, what is that word? Protestantism. Was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. So Protestantism is the thing that Satan is seeking to destroy. Now I know many of us think that what Satan is trying to destroy is simply Adventism. And you would be correct if you understood that true Adventism is Protestantism. Because you see, in this day and age, a man can be called a Seventh-day Adventist and have no protest in him whatsoever. Isn't, isn't it so? And so we want to be Protestant Adventists, amen? It says, at this time, the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silenced, they knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. 
Somebody told me that the Jesuit Pope Francis has a duty to save us from climate change. The prophet told me that that man knows no duty except to extend the power of the papacy. The prophet went on to say, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to devote to number one, the overthrow of Protestantism, and number two, the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. Now here you have a picture of the man in question. And if we're honest with one another, the man appears to be more Christian than most of us in here. Now I partook in communion, but I'm not kissing a brother's feet. I have never done that yet. But this man plays his part so well, and this is what I want us to understand. He plays his part so very well. But we're told, when appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons, hospitals, ministering to the sick, may I add kissing feet, and the poor, professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus Christ, who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. Beloved, a leopard cannot change its spots. It was fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, beloved, but commendable when they served the interests of the Catholic Church. Under various disguises, pay close attention, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. Now, when you hear policy of nations, what, what comes to mind? We're talking about laws, brother. We're talking about an order that has come into uh, practice for the purpose of overthrowing Protestantism through the policies of the nation. So wherever you see a Jesuit standing in the, in the policy places of the nation, it reminds me of uh, just a year ago, Pope Francis was here in the United States of America addressing Congress, wasn't he? How can we wonder, beloved, if time is short? It says the Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe and wherever they went, United States of America, wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. And so my question to you, uh, is your protest dead? Don't answer that out loud. Is your protest dead? Because October 31st of this year, it's uh, spanning till, I believe, October 31st of next year, there is only one aim that the papacy has right now, and that is the end of Protestantism. Have you heard of this? Yeah. And so Protestantism, they're seeking to destroy it. This is the very purpose that we were told in inspiration hundreds of years ago that the Jesuit order existed for. And I'm telling you, the man is playing his role perfectly, beloved. Yeah. Do we understand our role? It's time to get dressed. Put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, amen? Yeah. Now. I asked you, is your protest dead? Beloved, irrespective of a yes or a no in our minds, I want us to understand that unless we understand the message that these two men brought in 1888, our protest is no protest. You see, in 1888, God performed through A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner what is known as CPR. The church had lost the heart of the message, lost focus on Jesus Christ, and was going into what we know as a spiritual cardiac arrest. Now, does anybody know what happens in cardiac arrest after four to six minutes? There begin I heard the brain, amen. The brain begins to suffer. There's permanent damage in the head. Beloved, this is the reason why wherever the 1888 message is found, there is a pulse in God's people. But wherever it is not, the people are going through a spiritual cardiac arrest and there is head damage. This is why theology changes. This is why, I heard this morning, that this is why we have wine uh, dripping into the doctrine, beloved. Mm. The only way that we can have a true protest is if we understand, understand the protest message that came in the year 1888. Now, speaking of this message, we are told, in Testimonies to Minister, page 91 and paragraph 2, I'm sure that you're familiar with this uh, statement. The Lord, in his great mercy, sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagoner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. 
It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. The end of the righteousness by faith is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is the righteousness of God perfectly reflected in you. Beloved, do you understand that we can have no protest against the man of sin if we don't believe that sin can be overcome? The man of sin is the embodiment of every principle that we find in sin. It's the mystery of iniquity. And so if you don't believe that the mystery of godliness is powerful enough to erode papal uh, doctrine, papal lifestyle, papal ideology from your mind, then you have no protest against the man of sin. But this 1888 message is a safeguard, and I'm thankful that the Lord sent it. She says, many had lost sight of Jesus. Have mercy. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. Jumping down. She says, this is the message. Say that with me. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. If this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world, do you think it's important that we understand it for ourselves? Are we glad that we heard, we heard some of it this morning? Yes. Praise God. This is a message that we cannot afford not to know. And so the question is, what is the 1888 message? I said that the 1888 message is the divine strategy. It's the what? The divine strategy, the divine strategy for rapid, successful warfare in this final generation. We're told in inspiration that as the papacy is moving, the final movements will be what? rapid ones. And so we need a message that is going to do with greater power and greater speed the work that needs to be done in this generation. I want to share with you a principle found in the book of 2 Chronicles. Let's turn there. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 15. The Bible says, and he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord God unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. Beloved, we are living in a spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen? So don't leave here and throw, uh, throw a punch and say, Brother Paul said to do so. But we are in a warfare. Satan is angry with those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Is that you? I'll say it for you. That is you. Praise God. Satan is at war with us. And in order for us to win this war, we need to understand that first and foremost, the battle is not ours. It's not my battle to fight. I don't possess the power to overcome Satan. I barely, no, I don't possess the power to overcome myself. And so if the battle is not mine, then would it make sense for the strategy to win to be mine? No. If the battle belongs to the Lord, then who does the strategy belong to? I mean, think about it. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, I'm going to breeze through this. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, that the Lord's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And so it makes sense to me that the Lord's method of planning a strategy to win a warfare wouldn't be the same as mine. Think about the Battle of Jericho, for example. How many of you believe that it was in the mind of those men to march around this wall so many times, scream, and see the, see the city defeated? That's not a strategy that we come up with. Think about the Red Sea. When they came and their backs were to the Red Sea and the Pharaoh was approaching, how many of you think that Moses had it in his mind to stretch forth his hand and part the sea? He dare not try. But you see, God was with him. And because the captain of our salvation was there, the strategy for successful warfare was effectual. Amen. Amen? But we're told in inspiration that the problem in these last days is that we're running around seeking to plan for God how to win a war that doesn't belong to us. My job, beloved, your job, is not to plan how to win this warfare for Jesus. It's to understand his strategy and get on board. Amen. What do you say? Amen. Amen. Now, we're told in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 299 in paragraph 2, when light goes forth to lighten the earth, 
Instead of coming up to help the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Let me tell you, pay close attention, beloved. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to what? Any human planning. You mean to tell me I can't plan out the 1888 message? No. You see, I told you that the 1888 message was a divinely laid strategy. That means that Jesus divinely calculated every aspect of the plan of salvation, didn't he? When you look at the sanctuary, the lamb, who supplied it? He's called the lamb of God, amen? So the father supplied the lamb. When you look in the holy place and the most holy place, the priest, which one of you have ever been into the holy or the most holy of the heavenly sanctuary? Nobody. But there's somebody that went before us, isn't that? His name is Jesus Christ. And so Christ in the outer court, Christ in the holy place, Christ in the most holy place. Beloved, it looks like it's all about Jesus. It looks as though, amen, it looks as though my entire dependency for winning this great controversy is in Jesus Christ. And so I can't possibly lay out a strategy. You see, God is so wonderful. When, when I was studying the sanctuary, we studied the sanctuary uh, a few, few months back. And when we saw that God was able to take such a vast plan and explain it through six pieces of furniture, beloved, yeah. I can't do that with my living room. But God was able to do it in the sanctuary. Can we trust his planning? Can we trust his mind? Yes, we can. She says, there will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God, to dictate even what movements shall be made when the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world. God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins in his own hands. She says the workers will be surprised by the simple means. The what? The simple means that he will use to bring about the perfect work of his righteousness. Inspiration says that the gospel is a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. And so she says we would be surprised at just how simple the gospel makes this thing. Beloved, the way of the transgressor is hard because in our own strength we are seeking to get righteousness. But when we recognize that righteousness is not something that we strive for, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 tells us that Christ is our righteousness. Yeah. It means that righteousness is actually an individual that we must encounter and experience, and he is able to sanctify us just the same. Amen. Amen. This is the mindset that we have to have when we're looking at righteousness, beloved. Yes. It is right doing, amen? amen? And Christ is the right doing of God. Amen. Praise God. Now, in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, we're told from the Apostle Paul, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies, the what? which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. There's something about prophecy that helps us to see how God will win the warfare. And there's one specific prophecy that I want us to focus on. There was a king in the Bible by the name of Cyrus. And King Cyrus is known for his defeating of what city? Babylon, the nation, he, he defeated Babylon, amen? But, beloved, there is a strategy found in the way that Cyrus conquered Babylon that is applicable to the 1888 message. Did you know that? We're going to take a look at this. In Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12, the Bible says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was what? Dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The Bible says that the way of the kings of the east cannot be prepared until the river Euphrates is what? Dried up. Dried up. Do we want to know what the river Euphrates is today? Yes. Do, we know what, do we know what Babylon is today? Are we dealing with ancient Babylon? Yes. No, it shall never again be inhabited. We are dealing with a spiritual Babylon. And so if we're dealing with a spiritual Babylon, do you suppose it would make sense that we're dealing with a spiritual Euphrates river? Yes. We're gonna see in a moment. In matters of war, beloved, it is always true that an intelligent captain, not just any captain, an intelligent captain, once he is sure of the enemy's source of power, makes diligent, strategic efforts to remove that source. Does that make sense? 
If you know your enemy's power over you, what you do is you plan to remove the power and then you're free. Amen? The power that Satan had over us was sin. The Bible says that Christ came. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So Christ understood. He works from cause to effect. If sin is causing my people to die and I am seeking to bring everlasting life, then the cause must be removed. Yes. Yes. Ascertain the cause, amen? The cause must be removed and then a remedy can be applied. And so the river Euphrates was the source of power for ancient Babylon. And modern spiritual Babylon has a very similar source. We must, just like King Cyrus did, remove this source of her power that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared today. Now, we're not going to go into it, but Cyrus actually typified Jesus Christ. The conquest that he had over ancient Babylon actually typifies the conquest that Christ has over spiritual Babylon through the 1888 message. Now, are we familiar with Daniel chapter 5? There was a feast in Babylon, the night that Cyrus overcame the city. And what were the people in Babylon doing? Peace and safety. Amen? They were drinking the wine of Babylon, partying, and they were jesting. Now, my question is, when I read, this, when I read the account, I wondered to myself, why was the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, so comfortable knowing, beloved, that the enemy had circled Babylon like that? Your enemy is right outside, and you're, you're having a party, my brother? Why was he so comfortable? You see, Belshazzar understood that so long as the river Euphrates flowed through Babylon, they had drinking water, they had bathing water, they could, uh, the, hanging Babylon, the hanging gardens of Babylon would be irrigated so there was food, amen? They had no worries so long as the enemy remained outside. But God has a plan that is going to dry up that river and we are going to enter right into the city and call his people out. And I want to show you how this operates, how this works. King Belshazzar and his men knew that the city of Babylon was practically impregnable to any assault that Cyrus and his men could conduct from the outside. They knew that the enemy, so long as he remained on the outskirts of the city, could in no way conquer Babylon. Babylon would stand. Babylon would what? Babylon would stand so long as the great river Euphrates flowed freely through her. This was the secret to her power. Now remember, we spoke a moment ago. What do you do with the enemy's source of power? What do you do? You take it away. And what happens when you take that away? Does the enemy have power over you anymore? No. I want to introduce you to a man known as Stephen Haskell. And Stephen Haskell, in his book, The Story of Daniel the Prophet, explained that the way in which Cyrus conquered was a strategy. In the midst of their feasting and rioting, none had noticed that the waters in the Euphrates were steadily diminishing. The besieging army of Cyrus, which had long been held at bay by the massive walls, was eagerly watching the river. The river had been turned from its course. Now, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15 tells us that when we're dealing with waters in prophecy, what is, what is water symbolic of? Peoples, nations, tongues. And so the river Euphrates that supports Babylon today are actually the people, the nations, and the tongues that are supporting the papacy at this moment. And so we need a strategy that is going to take away that support. Can you see it? We need a strategy. We need a message. We need a what? We need a message, beloved, that is calculated by Jesus Christ to remove the hold over these darkened minds that the papacy has had for all these years. Now, when the Reformation began, it was the light of righteousness by faith that led us through the darkness. When the Reformation ends, it will be the light of righteousness by faith with greater power. I'm, gonna, I'm about to end right here, but I want you to pay very close attention to this right here. What do you do with the source of your enemy's power? Take it away. You take it away. And what happens as a result? Do they have power over you? No. Do we want to deal with a powerful papacy or a powerless papacy? Powerful. Or we want to cripple that thing, amen? We want to give the papacy a deadly wound that it can't heal. And you see, I was thinking, I was thinking to myself earlier today about David and Goliath. Do you suppose that Goliath would have fell as he did if David, if the stone that David uh, threw with his sling had hit Goliath in his toe? Mm -mm. 
What about if it hit him in his shoulder? No. You see, it went straight for the head. It was a headshot. Now, Genesis 3.15 tells me that Jesus has a headshot plan, beloved, that the enemy's head will be crushed. And so if there is a headshot plan, it means that it is specifically calculated to do just that. It is a wound from which Goliath, the papacy, cannot be healed. We're told in the great controversy. Now, once I give you the secret of it, do you want to know the secret of the papal power? Once I give you the secret, beloved, I'm going to let you know this right now. And I'm very serious. We are all accountable. We are what? But be encouraged. Because once you know the secret of the papal power, not only are you accountable, you are enabled to overcome the beast, his name, his number, and everything that goes with it. There is no fear for the Adventist who is a Protestant and understands this message. This message is the pulse of the Reformation. And wherever it goes, there is revival. We're told in Great Controversy, page 572 in paragraph 2. If the papacy, is pre- the papacy is prepared for how many classes? Two classes of mankind embracing nearly the whole world. Now, I love that it says that the papacy nearly has power over the whole world. Because the Bible told me that John saw a people that it didn't have power over. Amen? So it nearly has power over the whole world because of these two classes. Number one. Those who would be saved by their merits. Salvation by works. And number two, those who would be saved how? In their sins. Here is the secret of its power. The secret to the papal power, beloved. The reason why the Bible stresses that all the world, how much of the world? All the world will wander after the beast is because the entire world is divided into one of two classes. Those who believe that they can be saved by their works and those who believe they can be saved by their sins. But in 1888, Mm -hmm. there came a message that was a remedy to that. A message that showed us that it is not by my works that I am saved. By no man, no flesh is justified by the deeds of the law. Amen? Amen. But it also showed me that I can't possibly be saved in my sins. Mm -hmm. You see, yes, Jesus is perfectly fine with me coming to him just as I am. As a matter of fact, he came to me just as I am. But the truth is that when Jesus comes to us, he leaves us in a condition much better than when he found us. God loves us too much to leave us in. You see, the Bible says that Christ came to save us from our But I want you to hear that if Jesus came to save you from your sins, your sins are dangerous. Sin is not our friend. Grace is not a license to continue in sin, beloved. You need to understand that it is the emancipation papers of the race. Grace is the enabling power of God to cease from all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to sin. There is no one in this room who has an excuse to walk out a sinner. But even if we walked in that way, can we walk out by the power of God in power? Yes, we can. Now, This is my final thought right here. In Great Controversy, page 99, paragraph 3, we're told, About this time, there arrived in Prague two strangers from England, men of learning who had received the light and had come to spread it in its distant land. Beginning with an open attack on the Pope's supremacy, they were soon silenced by the authorities. Did their method work? No. You see, these two men showed up in Prague and decided, the man of sin, I'm going to preach against the man of sin. And all they focused on was Pope Francis. But the the spirit of prophecy says that method does not work. We need a better method. She says, beginning with an open attack on the Pope's supremacy, they were soon silenced by the authorities. But being unwilling to relinquish their purpose, they had recourse to other measures. Being artists as well as preachers, they proceeded to exercise their skill. In a place open to the public, they drew two pictures. Now, for those of you who are familiar with it or not familiar with it, I would encourage you to read it. She says that on one side of the painting, they drew Jesus Christ coming in on a donkey humble into Jerusalem. And on the other hand, they drew the Pope in his, uh, you know, his pontifical robes, and he had his gold and his, his mitre and all these things. And she says that this contrast, here was a sermon which arrested the attention of how many? Do you understand what you just read? A moment ago, we read that the entire world is divided into how many classes? And you just read that you have a method that reaches all classes, beloved. The method is very simple. We don't save the world by talking about Pope Francis or uplifting the man of sin. 
We save the world by lifting up the man of Calvary. The Bible refers to this in John chapter 12 and verse 32. Jesus said, and this is what I call the gospel law of attraction. Jesus said, and I, if I should be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. You see, Adventists today are planning strategies. My brother, how are we going to um, get these people into church? Let's knock on 35 doors. How about that? Let's do that. Let's, uh, let's form a, a, a youth group and reach out in this way. Beloved, the best method, lift up Jesus. And so if you must talk about dress reform, that's fine. Just make sure it's the robe of Christ's righteousness in exchange for your own filthy rags. If you must talk about the Sabbath, that's fine. But make sure the Lord of the Sabbath is the power therein. And if you must talk about the sanctuary, the blessed sanctuary, make sure that it is not a bloodless sanctuary that we are presenting. Christ is the center of the message. He's the heart, amen? The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I'm thankful that this message will inflict a final wound that the papacy cannot heal from. Can we trust his strategy? Yes, we Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, we're thankful for your efficiency in battle strategy, dear Lord. Father, for years since after 1888, your church has been striving, dear God, to realize the practicality of that message, dear Lord. Father, we need much more power and we need much more submission. I pray that you will be with every mind in this room. Continue with us as you bring us deeper yet. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will equip us to be a part of that final team, that final number who get the victory over the beast because they have the strategy that Jesus laid. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.